Thank you for joining us today at Connection Point. Whether this is one of your first times joining us or maybe even with us a while, we are so glad that you're here. And I wanna take a minute to personally invite you to connect with us as we get started today. And all you need to do is text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen and you'll receive a full listing of all the ways you can connect with us today. We're looking forward to our merry and bright Christmas Eve services here at Connection Point, where you can experience the joy of this season with your friends and family on December 23rd and 24th. This is a great opportunity to connect your friends, your neighbors, and family with Jesus. So be sure to text the word CONNECT to receive our digital Christmas invites that you'll be able to send to all the special people in your life. And we still need help making our Christmas services magical. If you feel called to serve this Christmas, specifically with parking guests or photographing special moments, you can text the word CONNECT to sign up and learn more. We can't wait to see how God uses our Connection Point family to reach people for Jesus this Christmas. Parents, don't forget we have an on-demand worship experience for your kids, birth through elementary. You can head to connectionpoint.org forward slash kids online to watch these services at any time. And one more thing before we get started, we have a time of communion for you at the end of our service today. You can stay tuned at the end or you can access it on demand in our weekly Saturday email. Grab some crackers and juice and make sure you take advantage of this meaningful experience. Thank you for joining us this weekend. Let's get ready to worship.
Church, I'm excited to share with you a reminder of how your generosity is making an impact here on our Brownsburg campus. God has given us the bold vision to maximize and multiply Jesus followers. As we see God multiply Jesus followers here on our campus, we are so thankful for so many amazing volunteers. God is using them each and every week. I want to share a letter 
we recently received from one of these incredible volunteers. For several years, we've been able to partner with the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center. We have volunteer leaders that go regularly to the Salvation Army and disciple the men that are going through a drug rehab program. Many of these men make the decision to follow Jesus and then periodically a group of them will come here, attend a Saturday evening service and get baptized. Here's a letter we received from a volunteer early in November when that group was here. Last Saturday night, I was the campus photographer at Connection Point. As you know, a group of guys from the Salvation Army visited with us and were baptized. A couple of the guys were looking around the facility and the conversation turned towards the children's area. So I volunteered to take them on a quick tour. I cleared it with the door guard and promised to keep the guys with me on the tour. As the quick tour was winding down, one of the guys asked if it would be okay for his daughter to visit here. She was in second grade. I said we'd love to have her. The second question caught me by surprise, and after a lifetime in ministry, that's hard to do. He asked me this, how much does it cost to go to church here? I replied, it doesn't cost anything to go to church here. In fact, there are times when it's the exact opposite. Some of our members have faced severe financial hardship, and this church has helped them pay some of their bills. How much does it cost to go to church here? What a question. God forgive those who have sung the good news so off key that people think they need to pay to go to church anywhere. Imagine this church. You may have neighbors, co-workers, or even friends who need the hope of Jesus and they think they have to pay for it. Isn't that the beautiful message we get to share about our Savior this Christmas season? He's already paid the price for each of us. Together, church, let's be inviting to one of our seven Christmas Eve services expectantly, knowing that God will use us together to reach hundreds who will hear the good news of salvation through Jesus at our Christmas Eve services. Thank you, Connection Point, for being a bright light of hope in a dark world. Your faithfulness is changing lives and making an eternal impact. Now let's prepare our hearts for the word of God from Pastor John. Hey, welcome to part two of our series called Merry and Bright. And each week of this series, we're asking this question, how can you be merry and bright in a world of sadness and darkness? How can you be merry and bright in a world of busyness and distraction? And each week, we're looking into the Christmas story, and we're really finding meaningful, significant answers to that question. Uh, today, we're going to unpack a really significant answer to this question of how can you be merry and bright? And I want to kick us off before we get into the big, deep answer by just showing you some of the amazing things that God is doing in the world right now. Uh, one of these I've been wanting to announce since October that a number of our fifth and sixth grade students were part of the Brownsburg Junior Bulldogs football team. And congratulations because this year the Brownsburg Junior Bulldogs won the Indiana Elementary Football State championship. Now here's what's so cool about this. The coach for this team, you can see him here praying after the championship game. This is head coach Lloyd Brown. Uh, Lloyd and his wife Danae are longtime members of Connection Point. Lloyd had played Division I football himself and he's one of these men of God who just takes the presence of God out into our community. So proud of Coach Brown and his family and these young men. And I love it that uh, Coach Brown finishes every game praying with his athletes, but after his team won the state championship to pause and literally give the glory to God and lead these young men in giving God the glory. Uh, I hope that's something you can join me in celebrating today. There's discouraging things in the world. There's sickness. There's brokenness. But our God is at work every day all throughout the year. He's also been at work through the Yuletide Festival. And that's a huge event that we're doing here every weekend in December. And the real purpose of this is for people in our community who wouldn't go to a church to set foot on our campus. And when Yuletide launched last Saturday, we had over 1,000 guests from our community. Here's a few of them. Ice skating, 
Here's a family in the walk-in snow globe getting their picture taken. And probably my favorite story from the Yuletide and the traffic that we had through our building and that we're having every weekend is that we had some communion cups, pre-sealed communion cups that were left out. And we had some folks... um, think that those were wine samples and thankfully we had staff who were able to lovingly explain to them that those are for communion and they're not wine and I just love that. I love stories of people who've never been in a church like ours setting foot in here because here's what I know. If their heart is at all tuned into God or seeking God, they're going to hear from God and we have so many stories. Our church is made up of people who just were seeking God and they came into this place or they joined us online. They heard the word of God taught like never before. They believed in God. They called out to Jesus and he then changes them, changes their identity, their behavior, their families. And that's why we're here, church, to bring the hope of Jesus to a world that is so in need of hope. Well, if you're a guest with us, we're just thrilled that you've joined us for this season, Mary and Bright. And uh, pardon me while I just encourage the people who are a regular part of this church just a little bit more, okay? We do every year a thing called the Holiday Project. And what this is, is we partner with our local schools, and the schools actually identify about 120 families who are in financial need. These are families that are doing their best to make ends meet, but they're not going to be able to have uh, Christmas presents and new pajamas and new jackets. And so what happens every year is thousands of people from our church work together to adopt these 120 families and give each family an over-the-top Christmas experience with uh, new pajamas and clothes for everyone, new winter coats, uh, all sorts of Christmas presents that the families ask for, including experiences in church. I just want to say I'm so proud of you that you do this every single year. Every August or September, we'll put out the families, and they all get adopted so quickly, and I'm just so proud of you as the body of Christ for what you're doing. Hey, one other thing I want to celebrate, and I know every week here we have babies born into our church family, and I wish we could celebrate them all, but there's one that I just have to tell you about. This is Aaron and Audrey, who serve actually on our staff team. And I get to work really closely with Aaron. He's a huge help to me in what God has called me to do. And uh, they have three boys, and I've known them for a number of years, and we have been praying intentionally asking God for a baby girl because this was a desire of their heart. They loved their three boys, but they were just praying and praying for their fourth one to be a girl. And baby Ember was born this last Sunday. Actually, while many of us were doing church on a Sunday morning, baby Ember came into this world. She's happy. She's healthy. And uh, Aaron and Audrey, we're so proud of you guys. We're so grateful for you. And we're just cheering you along. Well, speaking of kids, one last thing to celebrate, and that is our high school students. Uh, Praise God for a true movement of his spirit here in our congregation from birth all the way up to 12th grade to college. We've got three new small groups starting for college-age students who are single young adults, but I want to just point out this image of our high school worship. Uh, This was shared on social media by one of our high schoolers. And my wife showed me the post and I was reading what this young woman of God wrote about her relationship with God and how the ministry of Connection Point has helped her to believe in God, to put her faith in Jesus, and to find her full identity in him. And I just want to say, church, way to go. I hope you know that God is using you. He's using your faithful serving, your faithful praying, your faithful giving, and your faithful showing up and being here. And he's using it to reach people around the world, to reach people online, and to raise a generation. Well, I wanted to start with that good news. Because I also know that right now, so many people are battling sickness. Uh, Within the last week, I've had uh, two of my uh, good friends let me know that they've gotten cancer diagnoses and walking and praying with them, kneeling at my bed every night, praying for God's hand of healing on them. And I just know this, that sometimes in life we face problems that are bigger than our capacity. 
You know, there are times that we face a problem and we can just kind of muscle up and be smart and work hard and get through it. But there are other times that we face problems that we just can't solve in our own strength. I get to be part of one of our small groups here. We've got hundreds of small groups. And if you're not in one, you can text the word group to us and we'll get you in one. Our small group, we've got a text thread where we all keep in touch throughout the week and we share prayer requests. And uh, one person in our small group had surgery. Two people in our small group um, are experiencing long COVID symptoms from having had COVID. And others have friends and family who are going through difficulty. And this last week, someone from my small group, we were all sharing our needs and our prayer requests. And someone said, we need some praises. We need some good news. We need to be reminded that God is at work. And that's why I wanted to share with you those stories and just remind you, God is at work every day through the church that you're a part of. But the reality is sometimes in our personal lives, we face difficulties and problems that we just can't solve. In fact, I'd like to get really personal just between you and God and ask you this question. What enemy stands in the way of a Merry Christmas for you? Or put another way, what is it that has stolen your joy or your peace? What has maybe taken your health or taken some of your relationships? What stands between you and the Christmas season that you wish you could be experiencing? Uh, is it maybe that you're having anxiety and, and what stands in the way is your peace has been taken away? Maybe it is sickness. Maybe it's discouragement. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Uh, just between you and God, would you identify the answer to that question of the enemy that is blocking you from having the Christmas experience that you want. And I really want you to identify that. And in this moment, just invite God to speak to you today. Invite God to show you his solution to that problem. In fact, if I could ask you one more question, I wonder this. If you could leave today, if you could leave this message in God's word, knowing how to defeat that enemy or that problem... Would you want to know how? Well, we're going to find the answer in the word of God. And just like last week, it's in the Christmas story as we look at it with eyes of faith and God shows us new things in a familiar story. In fact, I can pretty much guarantee you, even if you've been in church for a hundred years, you've probably never heard quite this detail of the Christmas story. It's found in Luke 1 verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. Now, if you're wondering who Elizabeth is, watch part one of this series. She's an old woman who had a lifelong desire to be a mom, and that desire was unmet. But in the difficulty of decades of unmet desire, Elizabeth continued to believe God, to serve God, to pray, and then God fulfilled her dream in an impossible way. She became pregnant, and now she's about six months along, and that's when this angel Gabriel goes to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now, Nazareth is where Jesus is going to grow up. In fact, I've got a map behind me. If you want to look at this, this is part of Israel. And I've identified Galilee at the top. That's the region. Nazareth, that's the city where Jesus will experience his boyhood. But you probably know that he was born in Bethlehem. And we're told later in the story that there was a census taken. And Jesus' mom, Mary, was engaged to Joseph who was an ancestor of King David, it was King David who had been born in Bethlehem. So you've seen the pictures and you've heard the story of Mary on a donkey and Joseph traveling with her from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, and that's where Jesus was actually born. But none of that has happened quite yet. Let's pick up in verse 27. This angel appears to a virgin who's pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Joseph, notably, is a descendant of David, a great hero of the Israeli people, of the Jewish people, a great man of God, 
a man after God's own heart. This virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, I want to give you our big idea here, and then we're going to dive really deep into this story in a way that maybe you've never quite heard before. Here's the answer to our question. What can you do when you're facing giant problems? How can you be merry and bright when you're facing giant problems? And here's the first part of the answer. You need to know that the God who is with you is bigger than the trouble in front of you. Remember, the angel said to Mary, God is with you. The Lord is with you. And I don't know what you're going through this Christmas season, but God wants you to know today that he longs to be with you. If you're a follower of Jesus, he's there and you can pray to experience his presence. If you don't yet know for sure, you can invite God even in this moment to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to experience your presence. The God who is with you is bigger than than the trouble in front of you. Earlier I asked you to identify the enemy or the obstacle between you and the joy or the peace that you long for. As you face that enemy, step one is to realize that God is with you. You're not facing that enemy alone. God sees that enemy and God, who's not limited by time, already knows how he's going to defeat that enemy. Now, Mary, when this angel appeared to her, was frightened. This totally changes her plans. And we're told in verse 29 that Mary was greatly troubled, even though the Lord was with her. So if you're like, well, John, I'd like to think God's with me, but I feel greatly troubled. Well, feeling greatly troubled does not mean that God's not with you. In fact, God's often with us. When we feel deeply troubled, the book of Psalms said that he's near to the brokenhearted, that he upholds those who are crushed in spirit. God's with you even when you're feeling troubled. Mary was troubled and she wondered, what kind of greeting is this? I mean, why is an angel in my room? What's going on? And the angel said to her, verse 30, do not be afraid, Mary. You have actually found favor with God. It's so interesting that often the heroes in scripture have to go through difficulty. Moses had to go through the identity crisis of being raised Egyptian but actually being Jewish. David had to go through the crisis of being anointed as king as a young man but it would be 20 years until he would be king. All the heroes of scripture, even though they had God's favor, it didn't mean that their life would be a life of ease because they were chosen to do great work. And great work rarely happens at ease. The angel continues, verse 31, you will conceive. And Mary, you're going to give birth to a son. And here's the name that you are to give your son the name Jesus, or Yeshua, or Jeshua. Verse 32, he will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. That is the Son of God. So this is no ordinary baby. The Lord will give him, the angel continues, the throne of his father David. In other words, he's going to be the Messiah. Because Mary was raised and Joseph was raised knowing who David is. This great hero of the faith who had been a a young shepherd boy who was a person after God's own heart and he was faithful in the fields, but he was overlooked by his family. And he had these big God-sized dreams and for years and years they didn't come to fruition, but God had his eyes on David and 1,000 years Before the angel appears to Mary, the Spirit of God had told David and the Old Testament prophets that David's descendants would give birth to the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Almighty God on earth to fix humanity and to create a kingdom that will have no end. Now, 
something that maybe you haven't known before about the Christmas story, if you look in your Life Application Study Bible, here in Luke chapter 1, in just Luke chapter 1 and the very first verses of chapter 2, you're going to see David, king of Israel, referred to five times by name. Uh, Here's some of them behind me. Bethlehem, the town of David, a descendant of David. Jesus will take the throne of his father, David, the house and line of David. Now, I want, as you think about the giant problem that you're facing, as you think about the enemy between you and where you want to be in life, whether that's you and the Merry Christmas you want to have or just you and the life you want to have. Maybe it's the enemy of divorce. Maybe it's the enemy of cancer. Maybe it's the enemy of chronic sickness. Maybe for you it's the enemy of just discouragement. Perhaps depression or just, you're just down. I don't know what enemy you're facing, but it's so interesting that the Christmas story is just loaded with this reference to this young boy who faced an enemy that in his own strength he never should have been able to defeat. Now, we don't have an actual picture of Goliath But I've got a picture behind me that does a pretty good job. This is an actor, and he's seven feet tall. And this is from a movie called Troy, about the ancient Greek city of Troy and the battle that was fought there. But we're told that Goliath, in similar manner to this actor, would step out in front of the entire army of the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were a savage people, and they were taunting the Israelites, and they were making fun not only of the nation, but of their God. And Goliath, who's recorded as his height being in cubits, was somewhere, and when we translate those into feet, between nine and ten feet tall, this dude was huge. And he's a blood-stained warrior. And he's taunting God. And he is the enemy, the obstacle of life and well-being for David's family, for the entire nation. Because this Philistine army is about to defeat God's people. And in 1 Samuel 17, we get this moment where David, who's been a shepherd boy in the fields, has been being prepared by God. Last week, we looked at this theme in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life that God was preparing them through their faithfulness. In a similar way, David had learned to practice the presence of God. Remember the angel said to Mary, to Mary, the Lord is with you. David had learned to practice the presence of God. We know this from the Psalms that he wrote. That he was worshiping God when he was out there looking over his flocks. He was praying to God. And then later when he would be anointed, but it would be 20 years until he would become king, he continued to make music literally and to write words. What was he doing? He was pouring out his emotions to God. And I can only imagine young David when a lion or a bear, some predator animal, would come to his flock of sheep And would start to attack, to drag off one of the old ones, or one of the young ones, or one of the weak ones. And David would take the common weapon of a shepherd, which was a slingshot. And he would probably practice for hours and hours out there in the middle of nowhere. And he had no idea, as he was faithfully protecting his flock of sheep, that God was preparing him to save a nation and to lead a nation. And we're jumping into the moment in the story of David where he's a youngest. And maybe you've heard this, but I love this part because I'm a youngest. That when the prophet arrives to anoint the next king of Israel, he asks the dad, you know, hey, where are your boys? The dad doesn't even call for David because he's so young. He's so scrawny. The dad calls in all the big, strong, older brothers. And the prophet says, he's not here. And the dad says, well, there's, there's one more out in the field watching the sheep. And David arrives. He gets anointed. He gets this word from this prophet, you're going to be the king of Israel. But it was at least 15 years, probably 20, from the time he got that word to the time that he would wear that crown. At some point in that waiting season, David, who wasn't even old enough to fight against the Philistines, was simply doing a food run to deliver food to his brothers 
there on the front lines of the battle. And when he arrived with the food, he saw from a distance this giant. He saw him for himself. He hears him taunting Israel. And he says, how can everyone be standing by? This guy's making fun of our God. Someone's got to get out there and defeat this giant. And as David talks to the different soldiers, they're like, well, we agree, but who's going to go out there? He's twice the size of many of us. And then David says, I can do it because God is with me. He had learned to practice the presence of God. And when you practice the presence of God in your daily decisions and obstacles, what happens is God grows your faith. I can imagine David practicing his slingshot, and then there's a a predator animal coming for one of his sheep. And because he's in the habit of praying and talking to God, he says, Lord, guide my hand. So that this stone will knock out that animal and save my sheep. And then it happens. He says, wow, God, thank you. I needed you and I prayed and you helped me. And you can just see the stair steps in this young man's life as he practices the presence of God. One challenge at a time, God was preparing him for greatness. I wonder as you face your enemy, are you practicing the presence of God? Are you calling on God to be with you? If you're going through medical treatments, it's one MRI at a time. It's one doctor visit at a time. If you're going through a broken relationship, it's one emotion at a time. It's one text message or phone call or conversation at a time. God, guide my thoughts. Guide my words. If you're going through discouragement and depression, it's taking God your emotions and saying, God, I want to fill my mind with your word I want to be around your people and I'm going to be vulnerable and let them know I need people praying for me. I need people helping me. Practice the presence of God in your problem. Practice the presence of God in your pain. And like David, stair step your way up. Pray as you swing the sling that God will guide your hand and guide your words and you'll see God answer in little things and then in bigger things. And in 1 Samuel 17 verse 37 David is talking to the king of Israel, a guy named Saul. And he's more or less saying, here's why I think I can go and fight Goliath. And he says this, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion when I had to defend my sheep from lions and from the paw of the bear when I had to defend my sheep from a bear, the same Lord who rescued me then will rescue me now from the hand of this Philistine, Goliath. Well, Saul said to David, go, go for it. We have no other option. Go for it. And then look what he says, the Lord be with you. Because both David and Saul knew that unless God was with him, he would not prevail over Goliath. And the same is true for you. Giant problems require a giant God who is with you. You've probably heard before the songs about Emmanuel, the prophecies that the Messiah would be Emmanuel, and that the word Emmanuel literally means God with us. It's through Jesus that you can have confidence that God's not only powerful, he's not only good, he's not only loving, but he's actually with you. He's near you. He can help you. He sees what you're going through. He can strengthen your hand. He can give you the eyes to see. He can change your thoughts as you ask him to. You know, we face Goliath-sized challenges. And not only in our personal lives, but as a movement. God has given us, as a movement of Jesus followers, a vision to raise the spiritually strongest generation possible. That's a Goliath-sized challenge. Between all the information that's out there and all of the negativity that our young people are growing up in, a divided nation, a nation with racism, a nation full of addictions, a nation with increasing violence and brokenness, a nation where it's so rare to be able to have healthy dialogue between two people who can disagree. And here we are with this vision to raise sons and daughters who are full of peace and joy who shine like lights in the darkness, raising kids for purity in a corrupt generation, that's a Goliath-sized challenge. 
Chronic sickness, if you're dealing with that, that's a Goliath-sized challenge. The evils of the world around us, that's a Goliath-sized challenge. But here's the thing. We have a God who is a giant God. A God who's bigger than our problems and a God who is with us. I love it after Saul says to David, hey, go for it. Go out and see if you can beat Goliath. That David goes and he finds some stones for his sling. I love verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. Now, you've probably seen river rocks before. Sometimes people on their houses on the outside, they'll have river rocks. River rocks have been, the edges have been smoothed. That would allow it to sail through the air a lot better. But river rocks are dense. They're heavy. All the light part of the rock has been washed away by the movement of the water over years and years. David picks out five. These are probably fist-sized rocks that have been smoothed by the stream. He puts them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, here's what's remarkable. This breakthrough moment in David's life where God is going to use him to slay a giant and to save a nation and to bring glory to God, David doesn't go out there in the shiny armor of everyone else. David goes out there with the tools that God has built through his faithfulness, the same tools that he used out in the field. Now, if you're new to church, you might be skeptical of, oh, are these stories true? I mean, yeah, I heard about David and Goliath, but is it a myth? Is it really true? Well, the Philistines are well-documented people. David, king of Israel, is well-documented throughout history. But I also want you to know this. Using a slingshot in ancient warfare is well-documented. In fact, behind me here is a picture. You can see one of these stones this is actually from the Roman era, so this is about a thousand years after David. And there's actually record of entire Roman battalions that used slingshots. In fact, the Romans, as they got a little more advanced in their technology, they would um, melt down lead. And so that, that in, the, in the hand of that researcher there, that archaeologist, is actually lead. But it's about the same size as the stones that David would have used. And get this, uh, archaeologists have excavated, they've found thousands of these slingshotted stones and pieces of lead from the Roman army. And, and then one ballistics expert did a test. He got some of the strongest, most sophisticated modern slingshotters together. And here's what they found. At a 200 meter range, a good slingshotter can hit a normal-sized person at 200 meters. And get this, within the first 200 meters, a rock that size that has been slingshotted has the same impact and force as a bullet fired from a 44 Magnum pistol. That's all modern research. But I say that to let you know this story of a shepherd boy who'd been practicing for thousands of hours and he'd been using that slingshot to take down predator animals that were after his sheep. That story of that boy going out there in this huge giant that no one could beat in close hand combat. But as he starts running toward him and he's probably still 100 yards away or 50 yards away. He sails this huge rock straight into the face, straight into the head of this giant warrior. And the giant topples to the ground. You can just imagine the thud from this nine foot tall monster of a person. And David says over and over again, it's because God was with me. It's because the spirit of God was upon me. You know, as a follower of Jesus, you can live like part of a giant slaying legacy. Because through Jesus, you're born into the house of David as well. You have giant slaying in your spirit and in your soul as long as you're living in the presence of God, practicing the presence of God. How do you slay the giants in your life? You've got to claim the presence of a giant God who is with you. He's with you when you're shepherding. He's with you when you're in the field alone. He's with you when you're overlooked 
He's with you in the mundane. He's with you when you're chosen but then forgotten. He's with you when you're made fun of. He's with you when you're frustrated. You have a giant God who can defeat giant problems. But here's the thing. In David's life, there were hundreds of thousands of Israelite soldiers, but they didn't have the faith in the presence of God. God works through faith-filled people. He works through a faith-filled attitude. You see, faith in a giant God, it can transform the ordinary things in your life into giant slaying weapons. Think about that. How many people crossed that stream and just walked over those rocks? But David, because of his relationship with God, because he was in tune with the Spirit of God, because of his preparation, he didn't just see a stone to step on. He saw a projectile that could take out an enemy of God. I wonder in your life, where do you need a weapon to defeat an enemy? And I don't mean a physical weapon. Here's what I mean. If you're going through dialysis, every dialysis appointment can be a specific time of prayer. Hey, while I have to sit here and do this, I'm going to make it my time of prayer. And I'm going to turn an obstacle into an opportunity. I'm going to turn a river rock into a weapon that will slay giants as I pray for the problems in my life and I pray for the problems in the world. Wherever you need a weapon to slay a giant, to defeat an addiction, to defeat a brokenness, look at what you're already walking over every day and then look up to God, worship him, be faithful with what he's already given you. When I think of our vision to raise a generation that will love and serve God in a time when all the odds are against them, there are times when I kneel at my bed at night and I pray and I say, God, thank you for the faithful people at Connection Point. Thank you for our facility and our resources. Thank you for our faithful volunteers. But Lord, even with all these resources, the odds are against our sons and our daughters. The world they're growing up in, it's so fractured, it's so divided. What will the next 15 years, what's life even going to look like 15 years from now in this society? And it's in those moments practicing the presence of God that God reminds me he's a giant God. And as long as he's with us, he will empower us. With God, all things are possible. Let me say that again. With God... All things are possible. Nothing is impossible for him. Even the giant you're facing that you're saying, well, John, you know, as inspiring as this whole story is, I'm not David. I don't have a slingshot. I I don't, you know, that's good for you if you have that kind of faith, but that's not me. Here's what I want to encourage you today. It wasn't David who saved Israel from Goliath and the Philistines. It was God. And now the same God appears through an angel to a young woman who's been faithful as just probably a teenager. And he says, God is becoming human in the lineage of David. And he's coming to slay a bigger giant. He's going to defeat the giant of death. He's going to defeat the giant of tyranny. He's going to defeat the enemy of the soul, Satan himself, And he himself will, like David, rescue not only a nation, but the nations, but different than David. It's not just that God will be with him. He will be God. The power of heaven to rescue the people of earth from all the problems caused by hell. You see, that's what the Christmas story is really about. So if you're facing a giant, you need to know that this story and this promise of a Messiah is for you. Christmas is, is so much more than the lights and the tinsel and the nice warm movies and the hot chocolate. It's about a giant slaying God. Christmas is about God defeating death. In Matthew chapter 1, the same angel appears to Joseph to let him know what's going on now that Mary knows. And we're told in verse 20 of Matthew 1, after Joseph considered this, that Mary was pregnant, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David. (laughs) 
I love it that he says son of David there. And then he continues, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now earlier we considered that when David slayed Goliath, God was ready to slay the giant. But out of the hundreds of thousands of mighty people, only one had the faith to believe that God could do it. In a similar way, when Jesus came to earth to slay the giants of death and evil for all of us, for all of eternity, there were hundreds of thousands of people who saw him. They ate the food that he miraculously provided, but very few believed. And God has chosen this young woman and this young man who are engaged because he knows they believe the word of God to them. Against all odds, against common sense, against what the people around them would say and do, they believed God, and in that moment, they stepped out onto the battlefield, very much like David did, the battlefield of the universe. This angel continues, verse 21, she will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. Now, I was reading this, and I was thinking, man, how nice of the angel that it showed up and told Mary the name should be Jesus, and then it goes and tells Joseph the name should be Jesus. Because I don't know if you're anything like me and Mel, but when we were pregnant with Jack and with Zoe, and even as we prayed about Evie's name, our third, we had lots of opinions back and forth. And it took us a while to agree on a name. Can you relate to that? Did that happen in your house? And apparently God knew, I've got to tell both of them the same name. I can't just tell one of them. But here's what's so interesting about this name. We say it, Jesus, in English. But in Hebrew, it's Yeshua or Yeshua. You can pronounce it either way. And Yeshua literally means Jehovah is salvation. You realize the God who's with you, who you can practice the presence of God, he came to earth and he took the name Jehovah is salvation. Your Jesus, who you love and believe in, his name means Jehovah, that's a name for God, is salvation. Jehovah will come and he will provide a whole other level of salvation from what David, his ancestor, could do. Salvation not only from an evil nation, but salvation from death itself. Salvation from sin itself. Salvation from uh, all kinds of brokenness. The angel continued and he said, here's why you should name him Jeshua. Jehovah is salvation. Because he will save his people from their sins. Now, whether or not you realize it, the greatest need in your life is to be saved from your sins. I know there are other giants and other problems that maybe feel more pressing, but the greatest problem for every human being is actually sin. Because as long as there's sin in us, we can't be in the presence of God in heaven for all of eternity. As long as there's sin in us, God will not be with us. But through Jesus and his work on the cross we now are freed from sin jehovah saves this is the greatest hero this is the greatest miracle of all history and this is truly what christmas is all about you know it's a work of the holy spirit for us to realize that we need forgiveness from our sins and it's a gift from god when we realize that and when we realize that that's actually our greatest need You know, oftentimes people don't know what their greatest need is. Every parent understands this because there are days when our kids say, I don't want to go to school. I don't need to go to school. I don't need to learn. I don't want to do my homework. And we understand that they need to do that. But at at their age, they don't understand that yet. In a similar way, God lets us know he cares about your sickness. He cares about your brokenness. But he knows this, if you were to win the lottery, have perfect health, get everything you desire this next year, that eventually your body will still die because we're in a world that's broken by sin. And that with all that health and all that wealth, your relationships will still be strained and at times fractured and broken because we're in a world that's broken by sin. 
that there will be thieves, there will be lawsuits, there will be enemies, there will be opponents, there will be nation rising against nation, there will be wars because sin has broken human nature. And the only solution to all of this is a savior, Jehovah is salvation, who can not only fix the problems one by one, but can actually solve the deeper problem in all of humanity, the problem of sin itself. I'm guessing you've heard the classic Christmas carol, George Handel's Messiah. Handel's Messiah has these lines, and he shall reign forever and ever. If you know the song, maybe you can hear it in your mind. It's such an epic song with the full orchestra, and he shall reign forever and ever. And it's all about Jesus who came in the lineage of King David to not only be a baby and heal the blind and feed the hungry, to not only die on a cross and rise from the dead, but to ultimately be the king of kings and lord of lords, the king of the universe. Now for 20 years, that little shepherd boy David had to believe that someday he'd be king and it looked impossible for most of those 20 years. Then for a thousand years, his descendants believed that one of their tribe would end up being the Messiah, and they kept believing when it looked impossible. Now for 2,000 years, those of us who are followers of Jesus have believed that he didn't just die on the cross and rise again, but he's in heaven preparing a place for us, and he will return as King of kings and Lord of lords. Just as literally as he was born in a manger, he will break through the clouds with an army of angels and he will defeat the giant of death once and for all. He will take that enemy that you face who's behind so many of your problems, the enemy of the soul, Satan himself, and he's going to bind him and he's going to cast him into a lake of fire. In Revelation 11 verse 15, we get... The words that inspired Handel's Messiah, the famous Christmas song. And it goes like this. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. In other words, all the different kingdoms of human history, Rome and its Colosseums, Stalin and his tanks, World War II Germany and its Blitzkrieg aircraft, they all collapse and they all get folded into this true king of kings who's going to rule with justice. He's going to judge evil. He's going to give to the poor. He's going to care for those who were uh, mistreated all throughout history. And this kingdom will envelop every other kingdom And at that time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. In fact, the verse continues and it says this, the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. The giant slayer of all eternity. The greatest capital G giant slayer of all human history. And of his reign, there will be no end. Now here's the thing. Whether you like Jesus or not, at that true moment in the future, you will be kneeling with the rest of us and confessing that he is king of kings and lord of lords. But here's the thing. Those who choose to believe in him now get to be part of his eternal kingdom, get to be in heaven with him. And so do you know today that your sins have been forgiven? Do you know today that you've made Jesus not just a good example or someone you think highly of, but that you've made him your God and your Savior? I don't know what giant you're facing this Christmas season, but I know a God who's greater, a God who is with you, a God who has already defeated death and Satan and evil and in the future we're going to see it and it's going to be magnificent. And until then, don't give up practicing the presence of God as you face your giants. Claim your future with Christ. Believe in him today if you haven't yet and then walk with him this week. Let me pray that for you now. Father, I want to thank you that David defeated Goliath because you were with him. 
And then that you came into our world to defeat the giant of death, the giant of sin, the giant of evil and Satan himself. And Lord, we just want to thank you, Jesus, that because of the true Christmas story, you coming to earth, that our sins are forgiven. That all of us who have believed in you, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that we've been adopted into the family of God, that we have a place with you for all of eternity. And so, Lord, I pray in this moment for any who have not yet believed in you for their salvation, that this would be their day where they say, Jesus, forgive my sins. Be the Jehovah who saves for me. Forgive my sins. Adopt me into the family of God. And Lord, for every person who's struggling right now, facing an enemy, facing a giant of some sorts, would you be with them and would you allow them to experience your nearness in new and tangible ways? That you'd be with us just as you were with David, just as you were with Mary, that God with us would be the way we experience this month of December. We worship you, we love you, we walk with you now. In Jesus' name, amen.
In the book of John, chapter 1, we find John the Baptist in the region of Bethany, east of the Jordan River. When Jesus approaches him, and John exclaims to the people that he is with, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that would not have been an unusual image for those people to think about a lamb taking away sin or atoning for sin. But to see a man walking toward them, and John proclaimed that about Jesus, would have been something that would have been unusual and would have caused them to pause and think about what John was telling them. Of course, we know John was foretelling Jesus' death on a cross three years later. And so if we fast forward the story those three years, we find Jesus in the upper room celebrating his last Passover with the disciples, reclining at the table and having dinner with them when he takes the bread and he breaks it and he gives it to them and he said, take, eat, for this is my body broken for you. And then he takes the cup of wine and he gives thanks for it and he gives it to them and he said, drink from you, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Jesus' obedient death on a cross, his willingness to do that for us, which did save us from our sins. He took away all the sins of this world if we simply acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, we're thankful for that gift and his precious life in atonement for our sin. In your name we pray. Amen.